The City of God, Book One, Preface, and Chapters One through Fifteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo. Book One. Preface. The glorious city of God is my theme in this work, which you, my dearest son Marcellinus, suggested, and which is due to you by my promise. I have undertaken its defence against those who prefer their own gods to the founder of this city, a city surpassingly glorious, whether we view it as it still lives by faith in this fleeting course of time, and sojourns as a stranger in the midst of the ungodly, or as it shall dwell in the fixed stability of its eternal seat, which it now with patience waits for, expecting until righteousness shall return unto judgment, and it obtain, by virtue of its excellence, final victory and perfect peace. A great work this, and an arduous, but God is my helper." for I am aware what ability is requisite to persuade the proud how great is the virtue of humility, which raises us, not by a quite human arrogance, but by a divine grace, above all earthly dignities that totter on this shifting scene. For the king and founder of this city of which we speak has in scripture uttered to his people a dictum of the divine law in these words, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. But this, which is God's prerogative, the inflated ambition of a proud spirit also affects, and dearly loves that this be numbered among its attributes, to show pity to the humbled soul, and crush the sons of pride. And therefore, as the plan of this work we have undertaken requires, and as occasion offers, we must speak also of the earthly city, which, though it be mistress of the nations, is itself ruled by its lust of rule. CHAPTER One. For to this earthly city belong the enemies against whom I have to defend the city of God. Many of them, indeed, being reclaimed from their ungodly error, have become sufficiently creditable citizens of this city. But many are so inflamed with hatred against it, and are so ungrateful to its Redeemer for his signal benefits, as to forget that they would now be unable to utter a single word to its prejudice, had they not found in its sacred places, as they fled from the enemy's steel, that life in which they now boast themselves. Are not those very Romans who were spared by the barbarians through their respect for Christ, become enemies to the name of Christ? The reliquaries of the martyrs and the churches of the apostles bear witness to this, for in the sack of the city they were open sanctuary for all who fled to them, whether Christian or pagan. To their very threshold the bloodthirsty enemy raged, there his murderous fury owned a limit. Thither did such of the enemy as had any pity convey those to whom they had given quarter, lest any less mercifully disposed might fall upon them. And, indeed, when even those murderers who everywhere else showed themselves pitiless, came to those spots where that was forbidden which the license of war permitted in every other place, their furious rage for slaughter was bridled, and their eagerness to take prisoners was quenched. Thus escaped multitudes who now reproach the Christian religion, and impute to Christ the ills that have befallen their city. But the preservation of their own life, a boon which they owe to the respect entertained for Christ by the barbarians, they attribute not to our Christ, but to their own good luck. They ought rather, had they any right perceptions, to attribute the severities and hardships inflicted by their enemies, to that divine providence which is wont to reform the depraved manners of men by chastisement, and which exercises with similar afflictions the righteous and praiseworthy, either translating them, when they have passed through the trial, to a better world, or detaining them still on earth for ulterior purposes and they ought to attribute it to the spirit of these Christian times, that contrary to the custom of war, these bloodthirsty barbarians spared them, and spared them for Christ's sake, whether this mercy was actually shown in promiscuous places, or in those places specially dedicated to Christ's name, and of which the very largest were selected as sanctuaries, that full scope might thus be given to the expansive compassion which desired that a large multitude might find shelter there. Therefore they ought to give God thanks, and with sincere confession flee for refuge to his name, that so they may escape the punishment of eternal fire. They who with lying lips took upon them this name, that they might escape the punishment of present destruction. 
for of those whom you see insolently and shamelessly insulting the servants of Christ, there are numbers who would not have escaped that destruction and slaughter, had they not pretended that they themselves were Christ's servants. Yet now, an ungrateful pride and most impious madness, and at the risk of being punished in everlasting darkness, they perversely oppose that name, under which they fraudulently protected themselves for the sake of enjoying the light of this brief life. CHAPTER Two. There are histories of numberless wars both before the building of Rome and since its rise and the extension of its dominion. Let these be read, and let one instance be cited in which, when a city had been taken by foreigners, the victors spared those who were found who have fled for sanctuary to the temples of their gods. Or one instance in which a barbarian general gave orders that none should be put to the sword who had been found in this or that temple. Did not Aeneas see, dying Priam at the shrine, staining the hearth he made divine? Did not Diomede and Ulysses drag with red hands the sentry slain, her fateful image from your fane, her chaste locks touch, and stain with gore the virgin coronal she wore? Neither is that true which follows, that thenceforth the tide of fortune changed, and Greece grew weak. For after this they conquered and destroyed Troy with fire and sword, after this they beheaded Priam as he fled to the altars. Neither did Troy perish because it lost Minerva. For what had Minerva herself first lost, that she should perish? Her guards, perhaps? No doubt, just her guards. For as soon as they were slain, she could be stolen. It was not, in fact, the men who were preserved by the image, but the image by the men. How, then, was she invoked to defend the city and the citizens, she who could not defend her own defenders? Chapter 3 And these be the gods to whose protecting care the Romans were delighted to entrust their city. O oh, too, too piteous mistake! And they are enraged at us when we speak thus about their gods, though, so far from being enraged at their own writers, they part with money to learn what they say. And, indeed, the very teachers of these authors are reckoned worthy of a salary from the public purse, and of other honours. There is Virgil, who is read by boys, in order that this great poet, this most famous and approved of all poets, may impregnate their virgin minds, and may not readily be forgotten by them, according to that saying of Horace, The fresh cask long keeps its first tang. Well, in this Virgil, I say, Juno is introduced as hostile to the Trojans, and stirring up Aeolus, the king of the winds, against them in the words, A race I hate now ploughs the sea, transporting Troy to Italy, and home gods conquered. And ought prudent men to have entrusted the defence of Rome to these conquered gods? But, it will be said, this was only the saying of Juno, who, like an angry woman, did not know what she was saying. What then says Aeneas himself? Aeneas, who was so often designated pious, does he not say, Lo, Panthus, scaped from death by flight, priest of Apollo on the height, his conquered gods with trembling hands he bears, and shelter swift demands. Is it not clear that the gods, whom he does not scruple to call conquered, were rather entrusted to Aeneas than he to them, when it is said to him, The gods of her domestic shrines your country to your care consigns? If, then, Virgil says that the gods were such as these, and were conquered, and that when conquered they could not escape except under the protection of a man, what a madness is it to suppose that Rome had been wisely entrusted to these guardians, and could not have been taken unless it had lost them? Indeed, to worship conquered gods as protectors and champions, what is this but to worship not good divinities, but evil omens? Would it not be wiser to believe, not that Rome would never have fallen into so great a calamity, had they not first perished, but rather that they would have perished long since had not Rome preserved them as long as she could? For who does not see, when he thinks of it, what a foolish assumption it is that they could not be vanquished under vanquished defenders, and that they only perished because they had lost their guardian gods, when indeed the only cause of their perishing was that they chose for their protectors gods condemned to perish? The poets, therefore, when they composed and sang these things about the conquered gods, had no intention to invent falsehoods, but uttered, as honest men, what the truth extorted from them. This, however, will be carefully and copiously discussed in another and more fitting place. 
Meanwhile, I will briefly, and to the best of my ability, explain what I meant to say about these ungrateful men who blasphemously impute to Christ the calamities which they deservedly suffer in consequence of their own wicked ways, while that which is for Christ's sake spared them in spite of their wickedness they do not even take the trouble to notice, and in their mad and blasphemous insolence they use against his name those very lips wherewith they falsely claimed that same name that their lives might be spared." In the places consecrated to Christ, where for his sake no enemy would enter them, they restrain their tongues that they might be safe and protected, but no sooner do they emerge from these sanctuaries than they unbridle these tongues to hurl against him curses full of hate. CHAPTER four. Troy itself, the mother of the Roman people, was not able, as I have said, to protect its own citizens in the sacred places of their gods from the fire and sword of the Greeks though the Greeks worship the same gods. Not only so, but, Phoenix and Ulysses fell, and the void courts by Juno's cell were set the spoils to keep. Snatched from the burning shrines away, there Ilium's mighty treasure lay, rich altars, bowls of massy gold, and captive raiment rudely rolled in one promiscuous heap, while boys and matrons, wild with fear, in long array were standing near. In other words, the place consecrated to so great a goddess was chosen, not that from it none might be led out a captive, but that in it all the captives might be immured. Compare now this asylum, the asylum not of an ordinary god, not of one of the rank and file of gods, but of Jove's own sister and wife, the queen of all the gods, with the churches built in memory of the apostles. Into it were collected the spoils rescued from the blazing temples and snatched from the gods, not that they might be restored to the vanquished, but divided among the victors. While into these were carried back, with the most religious observance and respect, everything which belonged to them, even though found elsewhere. There liberty was lost, here preserved. There bondage was strict, here strictly excluded. Into that temple men were driven to become the chattels of their enemies, now lording it over them. Into these churches men were led by their relenting foes, that they might be at liberty. In fine, the gentle Greeks appropriated that temple of Juno to the purposes of their own avarice and pride, while these churches of Christ were chosen even by the savage barbarians as the fit scenes for humility and mercy. But perhaps after all the Greeks did in that victory of theirs spare the temples of those gods whom they worshipped in common with the Trojans, and did not dare to put to the sword or make captive the wretched and vanquished Trojans who fled thither, and perhaps Virgil in the manner of poets has depicted what never really happened. But there is no question that he depicted the usual custom of an enemy when sacking a city. CHAPTER five. Even Caesar himself gives us positive testimony regarding this custom. For in his deliverance in the Senate about the conspirators, he says, as Sallust, a historian of distinguished veracity, writes, that virgins and boys are violated, children torn from the embrace of their parents, matrons subjected to whatever should be the pleasure of the conquerors, temples and houses plundered, slaughtered, and burning rife, in fine all things filled with arms, corpses, blood, and wailing. If he had not mentioned temples here, we might suppose that enemies were in the habit of sparing the dwellings of the gods. And the Roman temples were in danger of these disasters not from foreign foes, but from Catalan and his associates, the most noble senators and citizens of Rome. But these, it may be said, were abandoned men and the parasites of their fatherland. CHAPTER six. Why then need our argument take note of the many nations who have waged wars with one another, and have nowhere spared the conquered in the temples of their gods? Let us look at the practice of the Romans themselves. Let us, I say, recall and review the Romans, whose chief praise it has been to spare the vanquished and subdue the proud, and that they preferred rather to forgive than to revenge an injury, and among so many and great cities which they have stormed, taken, and overthrown for the extension of their dominion, let us be told what temples they were accustomed to exempt, so that whoever took refuge in them was free. Or have they really done this, and has the fact been suppressed by the historians of these events? Is it to be believed that men who sought out with the greatest eagerness points they could praise, would omit those which, in their own estimation, are the most signal proofs of piety? Marcus Marcellus, a distinguished Roman who took Syracuse, a most splendidly adorned city, is reported to have bewailed its coming ruin, and to have shed his own tears over it before he spilt its blood. He took steps also to preserve the chastity even of his enemy. 
for before he gave orders for the storming of the city, he issued an edict forbidding the violation of any free person. Yet the city was sacked according to the custom of war, nor do we anywhere read that even by so chaste and gentle a commander orders were given that no one should be injured who had fled to this or that temple. And this certainly would by no means have been omitted, when neither his weeping nor his edict preservative of chastity could be passed in silence. Fabius, the conqueror of the city of Tarentum, is praised for abstaining from making booty of the images. For when his secretary proposed the question to him, what he wished done with the statues of the gods, which had been taken in large numbers, he veiled his moderation under a joke. For he asked of what sort they were, and when they reported to him that there were not only many large images, but some of them armed, Oh, says he, let us leave with the Tarentines their angry gods. Seeing then that the writers of Roman history could not pass in silence, neither the weeping of the one general, nor the laughing of the other, neither the chaste pity of the one, nor the facetious moderation of the other, on what occasion would it be omitted if, for the honour of any of their enemies' gods, they had shown this particular form of leniency, that in any temple slaughter or captivity was prohibited? CHAPTER Seven. All the spoiling, then, which Rome was exposed to in the recent calamity, all the slaughter, plundering, burning, and misery, was the result of the custom of war. But what was novel was that savage barbarians showed themselves in so gentle a guise, that the largest churches were chosen and set apart for the purpose of being filled with the people to whom quarter was given, and that in them none were slain, from them none forcibly dragged, that into them many were led by their relenting enemies to be set at liberty, and that from them none were led into slavery by merciless foes. Whoever does not see that this is to be attributed to the name of Christ, and to the Christian temper, is blind. Whoever sees this, and gives no praise, is ungrateful. Whoever hinders any one from praising it, is mad. Far be it from any prudent man to impute this clemency to the barbarians. Their fierce and bloody minds were awed, and bridled, and marvellously tempered, by him who so long before said by his prophet, I will visit their transgression with a rod, and their iniquities with stripes. Nevertheless my loving kindness will I not utterly take from them. CHAPTER Eight. Will some one say, Why then was this divine compassion extended even to the ungodly and ungrateful? Why, but because it was the mercy of him who daily maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust? For though some of these men, taking thought of this, repent of their wickedness and reform, some, as the apostle says, despising the richness of his goodness and long suffering, after their hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto themselves wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Nevertheless does the patience of God still invite the wicked to repentance, even as the scourge of God educates the good to patience. And so too does the mercy of God embrace the good that it may cherish them, as the severity of God arrests the wicked to punish them. To the divine providence it has seemed good to prepare in the world to come, for the righteous, good things, which the unrighteous shall not enjoy, and for the wicked, evil things, by which the good shall not be tormented. But as for the good things of this life, and its ills, God has willed that these should be common to both, that we might not too eagerly covet the things which wicked men are seen equally to enjoy, nor shrink with an unseemly fear from the ills which even good men often suffer. There is, too, a very great difference in the purpose served both by those events which we call adverse, and those called prosperous. For the good man is neither uplifted with the good things of time, nor broken by its ills, but the wicked man, because he is corrupted by this world's happiness, feels himself punished by its unhappiness. Yet often, even in the present distribution of temporal things, does God plainly evince his own interference. For if every sin were now visited with manifest punishment, nothing would seem to be reserved for the final judgment. On the other hand, if no sin received now a plainly divine punishment, it would be concluded that there is no divine providence at all. And so of the good things of this life, if God did not by a very visible liberality confer these on some of those persons who ask for them, we should say that these good things were not at his disposal, and if he gave them to all who sought them, we should suppose that such were the only rewards of his service, and such a service would make us not godly, but greedy rather, and covetous. Wherefore, though good and bad men suffer alike, we must not suppose that there is no difference between the men themselves, because there is no difference in what they both suffer. 
for even in the likeness of the sufferings there remains an unlikeness in the sufferers, and though exposed to the same anguish, virtue and vice are not the same thing. For as the same fire causes gold to glow brightly, and chaff to smoke, and under the same flail the straw is beaten small while the grain is cleansed, and as the lees are not mixed with the oil, though squeezed out of the vat by the same pressure, so the same violence of affliction proves, purges, clarifies the good, but damns, ruins, exterminates the wicked. And thus it is that in the same affliction the wicked detest God and blaspheme, while the good pray and praise. So material a difference does it make, not what ills are suffered, but what kind of man suffers them. For, stirred up with the same movement, mud exhales a horrible stench, and ointment emits a fragrant odour. CHAPTER Nine. What, then, have the Christians suffered in that calamitous period which would not profit every one who duly and faithfully considered the following circumstances? First of all, they must humbly consider those very sins which have provoked God to fill the world with such terrible disasters. For although they be far from the excesses of wicked, immoral, and ungodly men, yet they do not judge themselves so clean removed from all faults as to be too good to suffer for these even temporal ills. For every man, however laudably he lives, yet yields in some points to the lust of the flesh. Though he do not fall into gross enormity of wickedness, and abandon viciousness, and abominable profanity, yet he slips into some sins, either rarely, or so much the more frequently, as the sins seem of less account. But not to mention this, where can we readily find a man who holds in fit and just estimation those persons on account of whose revolting pride, luxury, and avarice, and cursed iniquities and impiety, God now smites the earth as his predictions threatened? Where is the man who lives with them in the style in which it becomes us to live with them? For often we wickedly blind ourselves to the occasions of teaching and admonishing them, sometimes even of reprimanding and chiding them, either because we shrink from the labour, or are ashamed to offend them, or because we fear to lose good friendships, lest this should stand in the way of our advancement, or injure us in some worldly matter, which either our covetous disposition desires to obtain, or our weakness shrinks from losing. So that, although the conduct of wicked men is distasteful to the good, and therefore they do not fall with them into that damnation which in the next life awaits such persons, yet, because they spare their damnable sins through fear, therefore, even though their own sins be slight and venial, they are justly scourged with the wicked in this world, though in eternity they quite escape punishment. Justly, when God afflicts them in common with the wicked, do they find this life bitter, through love of whose sweetness they decline to be bitter to these sinners. If any one forbears to reprove and find fault with those who are doing wrong, because he seeks a more seasonable opportunity, or because he fears they may be made worse by his rebuke, or that other weak persons might be disheartened from endeavouring to lead a good and pious life, and may be driven from the faith, this man's omission seems to be occasioned not by covetousness, but by a charitable consideration. But what is blameworthy is, that they who themselves revolt from the conduct of the wicked, and live in quite another fashion, yet spare those faults in other men which they ought to reprehend and wean them from, and spare them because they fear to give offence, lest they should injure their interests in those things which good men may innocently and legitimately use, though they use them more greedily than becomes persons who are strangers in this world, and profess the hope of a heavenly country. For not only the weaker brethren who enjoy married life, and have children, or desire to have them, and own houses and establishments, whom the apostle addresses in the churches, warning and instructing them how they should live, both the wives with their husbands, and the husbands with their wives, the children with their parents, and parents with their children, and servants with their masters, and masters with their servants, not only do these weaker brethren gladly obtain and grudgingly lose many earthly and temporal things, on account of which they dare not offend men whose polluted and wicked life greatly displeases them, but those also who live at a higher level, who are not entangled in the meshes of married life, but use meagre food and raiment, do often take thought of their own safety and good name, and abstain from finding fault with the wicked, because they fear their wiles and violence. And although they do not fear them to such an extent as to be drawn to the commission of like iniquities, nay, not by any threats or violence soever, yet those very deeds which they refuse to share in the commission of, they often decline to find fault with, when possibly they might by finding fault prevent their commission. 
they abstain from interference because they fear that if it fail of good effect their own safety or reputation may be damaged or destroyed, not because they see that their preservation and good name are needful, that they may be able to influence those who need their instruction, but rather because they weakly relish the flattery and respect of men, and fear the judgments of the people, and the pain or death of the body, that is to say, their non-intervention is the result of selfishness, and not of love. Accordingly, this seems to me to be one principal reason why the good are chastised along with the wicked, when God is pleased to visit with temporal punishments the profligate manners of a community. They are punished together not because they have spent an equally corrupt life, but because the good as well as the wicked, though not equally with them, love this present life, while they ought to hold it cheap, that the wicked, being admonished and reformed by their example, might lay hold of life eternal. And if they will not be the companions of the good in seeking life everlasting, they should be loved as enemies, and dealt with patiently. For so long as they live it remains uncertain whether they may not come to a better mind. These selfish persons have more cause to fear than those to whom it was said through the prophet, He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. For watchmen or overseers of the people are appointed in churches that they may unsparingly rebuke sin. Nor is that man guiltless of the sin we speak of, who, though he be not a watchman, yet sees in the conduct of those with whom the relationships of this life bring him into contact many things that should be blamed, and yet overlooks them, fearing to give offence, and lose such worldly blessings as may legitimately be desired, but which he too eagerly grasps. Then, lastly, there is another reason why the good are afflicted with temporal calamities, the reason which Job's case exemplifies, that the human spirit may be proved, and that it may be manifested with what fortitude of pious trust, and with how unmercenary a love it cleaves to God. CHAPTER X These are the considerations which one must keep in view, that he may answer the question whether any evil happens to the faithful and godly which cannot be turned to profit. Or shall we say that the question is needless, and that the apostle is vaporing when he says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God? They lost all they had, their faith, their godliness, the possessions of the hidden man of the heart, which in the sight of God are of great price. Did they lose these? For these are the wealth of Christians, to whom the wealthy apostle said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." They then who lost their worldly all in the sack of Rome, if they owned their possessions, as they had been taught by the apostle, who himself was poor without, but rich within, that is to say, if they used the world as not using it, could say in the words of Job, heavily tried but not overcome, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. As it pleased the Lord, so has it come to pass. Blessed be the name of the Lord." Like a good servant, Job counted the will of his Lord his great possession, by obedience to which his soul was enriched. Nor did it grieve him to lose, while yet living, those goods which he must shortly leave at his death. But as to those feebler spirits, who, though they cannot be said to prefer earthly possessions to Christ, do yet cleave to them with a somewhat immoderate attachment, they have discovered by the pain of losing these things how much they were sinning in loving them. For their grief is of their own making. In the words of the Apostle quoted above, they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. For it was well that they who had so long despised these verbal admonitions should receive the teaching of experience. For when the Apostle says, They that will be rich fall into temptation, and so on, what he blames in riches is not the possession of them, but the desire of them. For elsewhere, he says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. 
They who were making such a use of their property have been consoled for light losses by great gains, and have had more pleasure in those possessions which they have securely laid past by freely giving them away, than grief in those which they entirely lost by an anxious and selfish hoarding of them. For nothing could perish on earth save what they would be ashamed to carry away from earth. Our Lord's injunction runs, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And they who have listened to this injunction have proved in the time of tribulation how well they were advised in not despising this most trustworthy teacher, and most faithful and mighty guardian of their treasure. For if many were glad that their treasure was stored in places which the enemy chanced not to light upon, how much better founded was the joy of those who, by the counsel of their God, had fled with their treasure to a citadel which no enemy can possibly reach. Thus our Paulinus, bishop of Nola, who voluntarily abandoned vast wealth and became quite poor, though abundantly rich in holiness, when the barbarians sacked Nola, and took him prisoner, used silently to pray, as he afterwards told me, O oh Lord, let me not be troubled for gold and silver, for where all my treasure is, thou knowest. For all his treasure was where he had been taught to hide and store it, by him who had also foretold that these calamities would happen in the world. Consequently, those persons who obeyed their Lord when he warned them where and how to lay up treasure did not lose even their earthly possessions in the invasion of the barbarians, while those who are now repenting that they did not obey him have learnt the right use of earthly goods, if not by the wisdom which would have prevented their loss, at least by the experience which follows it. But some good and Christian men have been put to the torture that they might be forced to deliver up their goods to the enemy. They could indeed neither deliver nor lose that good which made themselves good. If, however, they preferred torture to the surrender of the mammon of iniquity, then I say they were not good men. Rather they should have been reminded that, if they suffered so severely for the sake of money, they should endure all torment, if need be, for Christ's sake, that they might be taught to love him rather who enriches with eternal felicity all who suffer for him, and not silver and gold, for which it was pitiable to suffer, whether they preserved it by telling a lie, or lost it by telling the truth. For under these tortures no one lost Christ by confessing him, no one preserved wealth save by denying its existence so that possibly the torture which taught them that they should set their affections on a possession they could not lose, was more useful than those possessions which, without any useful fruit at all, disquieted and tormented their anxious owners. But then we are reminded that some were tortured who had no wealth to surrender, but who were not believed when they said so. These too, however, had perhaps some craving for wealth, and were not willingly poor with a holy resignation and to such it had to be made plain, that not the actual possession alone, but also the desire of wealth, deserved such excruciating pains. And even if they were destitute of any hidden stores of gold and silver, because they were living in hopes of a better life, I know not indeed if any such person was tortured on the supposition that he had wealth. But if so, then certainly in confessing, when put to the question, a holy poverty, he confessed Christ. And though it was scarcely to be expected that the barbarians should believe him, yet no confessor of a holy poverty could be tortured without receiving a heavenly reward. Again, they say that the long famine laid many a Christian low. But this too the faithful turned to good uses by a pious endurance of it. For those whom famine killed outright, it rescued from the ills of this life, as a kindly disease would have done, and those who were only hunger-bitten were taught to live more sparingly, and inured to longer fasts. CHAPTER eleven, But, it is added, many Christians were slaughtered, and were put to death in a hideous variety of cruel ways. Well, if this be hard to bear, it is assuredly the common lot of all who were born into this life. Of this at least I am certain, that no one has ever died who was not destined to die some time. Now the end of life puts the longest life on a par with the shortest, for of two things which have alike ceased to be, the one is not better, the other worse, the one greater, the other less. And of what consequence is it what kind of death puts an end to life, since he who has died once is not forced to go through the same ordeal a second time? And, as in the daily casualties of life, every man is, as it were, threatened with numberless deaths, so long as it remains uncertain which of them is his fate, I would ask whether it is not better to suffer one and die, than to live in fear of all. 
I am not unaware of the poor-spirited fear which prompts us to choose rather to live long in fear of so many deaths, than to die once and so escape them all. But the weak and cowardly shrinking of the flesh is one thing, and the well-considered and reasonable persuasion of the soul quite another. That death is not to be judged an evil which is the end of a good life. For death becomes evil only by the retribution which follows it. They, then, who are destined to die, need not be careful to inquire what death they are to die, but into what place death will usher them. And since Christians are well aware that the death of the godly pauper whose sores the dogs licked was far better than of the wicked rich man who lay in purple and fine linen, what harm could these terrific deaths do to the dead who had lived well? CHAPTER Twelve. Further still, we are reminded that in such a carnage as then occurred, the bodies could not even be buried. But godly confidence is not appalled by so ill-omened a circumstance, for the faithful bear in mind that assurance has been given that not a hair of their head shall perish, and that therefore, though they be even devoured by beasts, their blessed resurrection will not hereby be hindered. The truth would nowise have said, Fear not them which killed the body, but are not able to kill the soul, if anything whatever that an enemy could do to the body of the slain could be detrimental to the future life. Or will someone perhaps take so absurd a position as to contend that those who kill the body are not to be feared before death, unless they kill the body, but after death, lest they deprive it of burial? If this be so, then that is false which Christ says, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. For it seems they can do great injury to the dead body. Far be it from us to suppose that the truth can be thus false. They who kill the body are said to do something, because the death-blow is felt, the body still having sensation, but after that they have no more that they can do, for in the slain body there is no sensation. And so there are indeed many bodies of Christians lying unburied, but no one has separated them from heaven, nor from that earth which is all filled with the presence of him who knows whence he will raise again what he created. It is said indeed in the psalm, the dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. But this was said rather to exhibit the cruelty of those who did these things, than the misery of those who suffered them. To the eyes of men this appears a harsh and doleful lot, yet precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Wherefore all these at last offences and ceremonies that concern the dead, the careful funeral arrangements, and the equipment of the tomb, and the pomp of obsequies, are rather the solace of the living than the comfort of the dead. If a costly burial does any good to a wicked man, a squalid burial, or none at all, may harm the godly. His crowd of domestics furnish the purple-clad dives with a funeral gorgeous in the eye of man, but in the sight of God that was a more sumptuous funeral which the ulcerous pauper received at the hands of the angels, who did not carry him out to a marble tomb, but bore him aloft to Abraham's bosom. The men against whom I have undertaken to defend the city of God laugh at all this, but even their own philosophers have despised a careful burial, and often whole armies have fought and fallen for their earthly country without caring to inquire whether they would be left exposed in the field of battle, or become the food of wild beasts. Of this noble disregard of sepulture, poetry has well said, He who has no tomb has the sky for his vault. How much less ought they to insult over the unburied bodies of Christians, to whom it has been promised that the flesh itself shall be restored, and the body formed anew, all the members of it being gathered not only from the earth, but from the most secret recesses of any other of the elements in which the dead bodies of men have lain hid? CHAPTER Thirteen. Nevertheless, the bodies of the dead are not on this account to be despised and left unburied, least of all the bodies of the righteous and faithful, which have been used by the Holy Spirit as his organs and instruments for all good works. For if the dress of a father, or his ring, or anything he wore, be precious to his children, in proportion to the love they bore him, with how much more reason ought we to care for the bodies of those we love, which they wore far more closely and intimately than any clothing? For the body is not an extraneous ornament or aid, but a part of man's very nature. And therefore to the righteous of ancient times the last offices were piously rendered, and sepulchres provided for them, and obsequies celebrated. And they themselves, while yet alive, gave commandment to their sons about the burial, and, on occasion, even about the removal of their bodies to some favourite place. 
and Tobit, according to the angel's testimony, is commended, and is said to have pleased God by burying the dead. Our Lord himself, too, though he was to rise again the third day, applauds and commends to our applause the good work of the religious woman who poured precious ointment over his limbs, and did it against his burial. And the gospel speaks with commendation of those who were careful to take down his body from the cross, and wrap it lovingly in costly cerements, and see to its burial. These instances certainly do not prove that corpses have any feeling, but they show that God's providence extends even to the bodies of the dead, and that such pious offices are pleasing to him as cherishing faith in the resurrection. And we may also draw from them this wholesome lesson, that if God does not forget even any kind office which loving care pays to the unconscious dead, much more does he reward the charity we exercise towards the living. Other things, indeed, which the holy patriarchs said of the burial and removal of their bodies, they meant to be taken in a prophetic sense, but of these we need not here speak at large, what we have already said being sufficient. But if the want and support of the living, as food and clothing, though painful and trying, does not break down the fortitude and virtuous endurance of good men, nor eradicate piety from their souls, but rather renders it more fruitful, how much less can the absence of the funeral, and of the other customary attentions paid to the dead, render those wretched who are already reposing in the hidden abodes of the blessed? Consequently, though in the sack of Rome and of other towns the dead bodies of the Christians were deprived of these last offices, this is not of the fault of the living, for they could not render them, nor an infliction to the dead, for they cannot feel the loss. CHAPTER fourteen. But, say they, many Christians were even led away captive. This indeed were a most pitiable fate, if they could be led away to any place where they could not find their God. But for this calamity also sacred scripture affords great consolation. The three youths were captives, Daniel was a captive, so were other prophets, and God the Comforter did not fail them. And in like manner he has not failed his own people in the power of a nation which, though barbarous, is yet human, he who did not abandon the prophet in the belly of a monster. These things indeed are turned to ridicule rather than credited by those with whom we are debating, though they believe what they read in their own books, that Arion of Methymna, the famous lyrist, when he was thrown overboard, was received on a dolphin's back and carried to land. But that story of ours about the prophet Jonah is far more incredible, more incredible because more marvellous, and more marvellous because a greater exhibition of power. CHAPTER Fifteen. But among their own famous men they have a very noble example of the voluntary endurance of captivity in obedience to a religious scruple. Marcus Atilius Regulus, a Roman general, was a prisoner in the hands of the Carthaginians. But they, being more anxious to exchange their prisoners with the Romans than to keep them, sent Regulus as a special envoy with their own ambassadors to negotiate this exchange, but bound him first with an oath that if he failed to accomplish their wish, he would return to Carthage. He went and persuaded the Senate to the opposite course, because he believed it was not for the advantage of the Roman Republic to make an exchange of prisoners. After he had thus exerted his influence, the Romans did not compel him to return to the enemy, but what he had sworn he voluntarily performed. But the Carthaginians put him to death with refined, elaborate, and horrible tortures. They shut him up in a narrow box in which he was compelled to stand, and in which finely sharpened nails were fixed all round about him, so that he could not lean upon any part of it without intense pain, and so they killed him by depriving him of sleep. With justice, indeed, do they applaud the virtue which rose superior to so frightful a fate. However, the gods he swore by were those who were now supposed to avenge the prohibition of their worship by inflicting these present calamities on the human race. But if these gods who were worshipped specially in this behalf, that they might confer happiness in this life, either willed or permitted these punishments to be inflicted on one who kept his oath to them, what more cruel punishment could they in their anger have inflicted on a perjured person? But why may I not draw from my reasoning a double inference? Regulus certainly had such reverence for the gods that for his oath's sake he would neither remain in his own land nor go elsewhere, but without hesitation return to his bitterest enemies. If he thought that this course would be advantageous with respect to this present life, he was certainly much deceived, for it brought his life to a frightful termination. 
By his own example, in fact, he taught that the gods do not secure the temporal happiness of their worshippers, since he himself, who was devoted to their worship, as both conquered in battle and taken prisoner, and then because he refused to act in violation of the oath he had sworn by them, was tortured and put to death by a new and hitherto unheard of, and all too horrible kind of punishment. And on the supposition that the worshippers of the gods are rewarded by felicity in the life to come, why, then, do they calumniate the influence of Christianity? Why do they assert that this disaster has overtaken the city because it has ceased to worship its gods, since, worship them as assiduously as it may, it may yet be as unfortunate as Regulus was? Or will someone carry so wonderful a blindness to the extent of wildly attempting, in the face of the evident truth, to contend that though one man might be unfortunate, though a worshipper of the gods, yet a whole city could not be so? That is to say, the power of their gods is better adapted to preserve multitudes than individuals, as if a multitude were not composed of individuals. But if they say that Marcus Regulus, even while a prisoner and enduring these bodily torments, might yet enjoy the blessedness of a virtuous soul, then let them recognize the true virtue by which a city also may be blessed. For the blessedness of a community and of an individual flow from the same source, for a community is nothing else than a harmonious collection of individuals, so that I am not concerned meantime to discuss what kind of virtue Regulus possessed, enough that by his very noble example they are forced to own that the gods are to be worshipped not for the sake of bodily comforts or external advantages, for he preferred to lose all such things rather than offend the gods by whom he had sworn. But what can we make of men who glory in having such a citizen, but dread having a city like him? If they do not dread this, then let them acknowledge that some such calamity as befell Regulus may also befall a community, though they be worshipping their gods as diligently as he, and let them no longer throw the blame of their misfortunes on Christianity. But as our present concern is with those Christians who were taken prisoners, let those who take occasion from this calamity to revile our most wholesome religion in a fashion not less imprudent than impudent, consider this and hold their peace. For if it was no reproach to their gods that a most punctilious worshipper of theirs should, for the sake of keeping his oath to them, be deprived of his native land without hope of finding another, and fall into the hands of his enemies, and be put to death by a long-drawn and exquisite torture, much less ought the Christian name to be charged with the captivity of those who believe in its power, since they, in confident expectation of a heavenly country, know that they are pilgrims, even in their own homes. End of Book One, Preface, and Chapters One through Fifteen. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org.